When I came back to Berlin out of captivity in the spring of 1950, I discovered I had a stepfather. My mother had never mentioned him. I had been writing from Brittany to Greta Besterman, but the Toppler engraved on a brass plate next to the bell pull at her new address turned out to be her name, too. As she slipped the key in the lock, she said quietly, Listen, Thomas. I'm Frau Tupler now. I married a kind man with a pension. This is his key, his name, and his apartment. He wants to make you welcome. From the moment she met me at the railway station that day, she must have been wondering how to break it. I put my hand over the name, leaving a perfect palm print. I said, I suppose there are no razor blades and no civilian shirts in Berlin, but some ass is already engraving nameplates. Martin Toppler was an old man who had been a tram conductor. He was lame in one arm as the result of a working accident and carried that shoulder higher than the other. His eyes had the milky look of the elderly lighter round the rim than at the center of the iris and he had an old woman's habit of sighing. Ah, yes, yes. The sigh seemed to be his way of pleading. It can't be helped. He must have been forty-nine at the most, but aged was what he seemed to me, and more than aged, useless, lost. His mouth hung open much of the time, as though he had trouble breathing through his nose but it was only because he was a chronic talker, always ready to bite down on a word. He came from Franconia, near the Czech border, close to where my grandparents had once lived. Greta and I can understand each other's dialects, he said, but we were not a dialect-speaking family. My brother and I had been made to say bread and friend and tree correctly. I turned my eyes to my mother, but she looked away. Martin's one dream was to return to Franconia. It was almost the first thing he said to me. He had inherited two furnished apartments in a town close to an American military base. One of the two had been empty for years. The occupants had moved away, no one knew where, perhaps to Sweden. After their departure, which had taken place at five o'clock on a winter morning in 1943, the front door had been sealed with a government stamp depicting a swastika and an eagle. The vanished tenants must have died, perhaps in Sweden, and now no local person would live in the place because a whole family of ghosts rattled about, opening and shutting drawers, banging on pipes moving chairs and ladders. The ghosts were looking for a hoard of gold that had been left behind, Martin thought. The second apartment had been rented to a family who had disappeared during the confused migrations of the end of the war and were probably dead too. At least they were dead officially, which was all that mattered. Martin intended to modernize the two flats raise them up to American standards. He meant by this putting Venetian blinds at the windows and gas-heated water tanks in the bathrooms and let them to a good class of American officer, too foreign to care about a small-town story, too educated to be afraid of ghosts. But he would have to move quickly. Otherwise his inheritance his sole post-war capital, his only means of getting started again, might be snatched away from him for the sake of shiftless and illiterate refugees from the Soviet zone, or bombed-out families still huddled in barracks or for late homecomers. This last was a new category of persons, all one word. It was out of his mouth before he remembered that I was one, too. He stopped talking, and then he sighed and said, Ah, yes, yes. He could not keep still for long. 
He drew out his wallet and showed me a picture of himself on horseback. He may have wanted to substitute this country image for any idea I had of him on the deck of a tram. He held the snapshot at arm's length and squinted at it. That was Martin Tupler once, he said. It will be Martin Tupler again. His youth, and a new right shoulder and arm, and the hot, leafy summers everyone his age said had existed before the war were waiting for him in Franconia. He sounded like a born winner instead of a physically broken tram conductor on the losing side. He put the picture away in a cracked celluloid case, pocketed his wallet, and called to my mother. The boy will want a bath. My mother, who had been preparing a bath for minutes now, had been receiving orders all her life. As a girl, she had worked like a slave in her mother's village guest house. And after my father died, she became a servant again, this time in Berlin to my powerful uncle Gerhard and his fat wife. My brother and I spent our winters with her, all three sleeping in one bed sometimes, in a cold attic room, sharing bread and apples smuggled from Uncle Gerhard's larder. In the summer, we were sent to help our grandmother. We washed the chairs and tables, cleaned the toilets of vomit, and carried glasses stinking with beer back to the kitchen. We were still so small we had to stand on stools to reach the taps. It was lucky you had two sons. Uncle Gerhard said to my mother once, There will never be a shortage of strong backs in the family. No one will exploit my children, she is supposed to have replied, though how she expected to prevent it only God knows, for we had no roof of our own and no money and we ate such food as we were given. Our uniforms saved us. Once we had joined the Hitler Jugend, even Uncle Gerhard never dared ask, Where are you going? Or where have you been? My brother was quicker than I. By the time he was twelve, he knew he had been trapped. I was sixteen and a prisoner before I understood. But from our mother's point of view, we were free, delivered. We would not repeat her life. That was all she wanted. In captivity, I had longed for her, and for the lost paradise of our poverty, where she had belonged entirely to my brother and to me, and we had slept with her, one on each side. I had written letters to her full of remorse for past neglect and containing promises of future goodness. I would work hard and look after her forever. These letters sent to blonde, young, soft-voiced Greta Besterman, had been read by Greta Tupler, whose graying hair was pinned up in a sort of oval balloon, and who was anxious and thin, as afraid of things to come as she was of the past. I had not recognized her at the station, and when she said timidly, Excuse me? Thomas? I thought she was her own mother. I did not know then, or for another few minutes, that my grandmother had died or that my rich uncle Gerhard, now officially denazified by a court of law, was camped in two rooms carved out of a ruin, raising rabbits for a living and hoping that no one would notice him. She had last seen me when I was fifteen. We had been moving toward each other since early this morning but I was exhausted and taciturn, and we were both shy, and we had not rushed into each other's arms, because we had each been afraid of embracing a stranger. I had one horrible memory of her, but it may have been only a dream. I was small, but I could speak and walk. I came into a room where she was nursing a baby. Two other women were with her. When they saw me, they started to laugh, and one said to her, Give some to Thomas. My mother leaned over and put her breast in my mouth. 
the taste was disgustingly sweet, and because of the two women I felt humiliated. I spat and backed off and began to cry. She said something to the women, and they laughed harder than ever. It must have been a dream, for who could the baby have been? My brother was eleven months older than I. She was cautious as an animal with me now, partly because of my reaction to the nameplate. She must have feared there was more to come. She had been raised to respect men, never to interrupt their conversation, to see that their plates were filled before hers, even as a girl to stand when they were sitting down. I was twenty-one. I had been twenty-one for three days. I had crossed over to the camp of the bullies and strangers. All the while Martin was talking and boasting and showing me himself on horseback. She crept in and out of the parlor, fetching wood and the briquettes they kept by the tile stove, carrying them down the passage to build a fire for me in the bathroom. She looked at me sidelong sometimes and smiled with her hand before her mouth, a new habit of hers. But she kept silent until it was time to say that the bath was ready. My mother spread a towel for me to stand on and showed me a chair where, she said, Martin always sat to dry his feet. There was a shelf with a mirror and comb but no wash basin. I supposed that he shaved and they cleaned their teeth in the kitchen. My mother said the soap was of poor quality and would not lather, but she asked me again from behind the screen of her hand, not to leave it under water where it might melt and be wasted. A stone under water might have melted as easily. There is a hook for your clothes, she said, though of course I had seen it. She hesitated still, but when I began to unbutton my shirt, she slipped out. The bath into which a family could have fitted was as rough as lava rock. The water was boiling hot. I sat with my knees drawn up as if I were in the tin tub I had been lent sometimes in France. The starfish scar of a grenade wound was livid on one knee, and that leg was misshapen, as though it had been pressed the wrong way while the bones were soft. Long underwear I took to be my stepfather's hung over a line. I sat looking at it and at a stiff, thin towel hanging next to it, and at the water condensing on the cement walls until the skin of my hands and feet became as ridged and soft as corduroy. There is a term for people caught on a street crossing after the light has changed. Pedestrian traffic residue. I had been in a prisoner of war camp at Rennes when an order arrived to repatriate everyone who was under 18. For some reason, my name was never called. Five years after that, when I was in St. Malo, where I had been assigned to a druggist and his wife as a free worker, which did not mean free but simply not in a camp, the police sent for me and asked what I was doing in France with a large PG, for prisonnier de guerre, on my back. Was I a deserter from the Foreign Legion? A spy? Nearly every other prisoner in France had been released at least ten months before, but the file concerning me had been lost or mislaid in Rennes and I could not leave until it was found. I had no existence. By that time the French were sick of me, because they were sick of the war and its reminders, and the scheme of using the prisoners the Americans had taken to rebuild the roads and bridges of France had not worked out. The idea had never been followed by a plan, and so some of the prisoners became farm help, some became domestic servants, some went into the Foreign Legion because the food was better. Some sat and did nothing for three or four years, because no one could discover anything for them to do. 
The police hinted to me that if I were to run away, no one would mind. It would have cleared up the matter of the missing file. But I was afraid of putting myself in the wrong, in which case they might have an excuse to keep me forever. Besides, how far could I have run with a large PG painted on my jacket and trousers? Here, where it would not be necessary to wear a label, because late homecomer was written all over me, I sensed that I was an embarrassment too. My appearance, the survival, the bleeding gums and loose teeth, the chronic dysentery and anemia, the craving for sweets, the reticence with strangers, the cast-off rags I had worn on arrival, all said war when everyone wanted peace, captivity when the word was freedom, and dry bread when everyone was thinking jam and butter. I guessed that now, after five years of peace, most of the population must have elbowed onto the right step of the right staircase, and that there was not much room left for pedestrian traffic residue. My mother came in to clean the tub after I was partly dressed. She used fine ash from the stove and a cloth so full of holes it had to be rolled into a ball. She said, I called out to you, but you didn't hear. I thought you had fallen asleep and drowned. I was hard of hearing because of the anti-aircraft duty to which I'd been posted in Berlin while I was still in high school. After the boys were sent to the front, girls took our places. It was those girls, still in their adolescence, who defended the grown men in uniform down in the bunkers. I wondered if they had been deafened, too, and if we were a generation who would never hear anything under a shout. My mother knelt by the tub and I sat on Martin's chair like Martin, pulling on clean socks she had brought me. In a low voice, which I heard perfectly, she said that I had known Martin in my childhood. I said I had not. She said then that my father had known him. I stood up and waited until she rose from her knees, and I looked down at her face. I was afraid of touching her in case we should both cry. She muttered that her family must surely have known him for the Toplers had a burial plot not far from the graveyard where my grandmother lay buried, and some thirty miles from where my father's father had a bakery once. She was looking for any kind of a link. I wanted you and Chris to have a place to stay when you came back, she said, but I believed she had not expected to see either of us again, and that she had been afraid of being homeless and alone. My brother had vanished in Czechoslovakia with the Scherner army. All of that army had been given up for dead. My uncle Gerhard, her only close relative, could not have helped her even if it had occurred to him. It had taken him four years to become officially and legally denazified, and now, as white as a white lilac, according to my mother, he had no opinions about anything, and lived only for his rabbits. It is nice to have a companion at my age, my mother said. Someone to talk to. Did the old need more than conversation? My mother must have been about forty-two then. I had heard the old men in prison camp comparing their wives and saying that no hen was ever too tough for boiling. Did you marry him before or after he had this apartment? After. But she had hesitated, as if wondering what I wanted to hear. The apartment was on the second floor of a large, dark block, all that was left of a workers' housing project of the 1920s. Martin had once lived somewhere between the bathroom window and the street. Looking out, I could easily replace the back walls of the vanished houses and the small balconies festooned with brooms and mops and the moist, oily courtyard. 
Winter twilight must have been the prevailing climate here until an air raid let the seasons in. Cinders and gravel had been raked evenly over the crushed masonry now, the broad concourse between the surviving house, ours, and the road beyond it that was edged with ruins looked solid and flat. But no, it was all shaky and loose, my mother said. Someone ought to cause a cement walk to be laid down. The women were always twisting their ankles, and when it rained you walked in black mud, and there was a smell of burning. She had not lost her belief in an invisible but well-intentioned someone. She then said, in a hushed and whispery voice, that Martin's first wife, Elka, was down there under the rubble and cinders. It had been impossible to get all the bodies out, and one day a bulldozer covered them over for all time. Martin had inherited those two apartments in a town in Franconia from Elka. The Tuplers were probably just as poor as the Bestermans, but Martin had made a good marriage. She had a dog, too, said my mother. When Martin married her, she had a white spitz. She gave it a bath in the bathtub every Sunday. I thought of Martin Tupler crossing this new, wide, treacherous front court and saying, Elka's grave. Ah, yes. Yes. I said it, and my mother suddenly laughed loudly and dropped her hand, and I saw that some of her front teeth were missing. The house looks like an old tooth when you see it from the street she said, as though deliberately calling attention to the very misfortune she wanted to hide. She knew nothing about the people who had lived in this apartment, except that they had left in a hurry, forgetting to pack a large store of black market food, some pretty ornaments in a china cabinet, and five bottles of wine. They left without paying the rent, she said, which didn't sound like her. It turned out to be a joke of Martin Topler's. He repeated it when I came back to the parlor wearing a shirt that I supposed must be his, and with my hair dark and wet and combed flat. He pointed to a bright rectangle on the brown wallpaper. That is where they took Adolf's picture down, he said when they left in a hurry without paying the rent. My father had been stabbed to death one night when he was caught tearing an election poster off the schoolhouse wall. He left my mother with no money, two children under the age of five, and a political reputation. After that, she swam with the current. I had worn a uniform of one kind or another most of my life until now. I remembered wearing civilian clothes once when I was fourteen for my confirmation. I had felt disguised and wondered what to do with my hands. From the age of seven I had stuck my thumbs in a leather belt. I had impressions, not memories, of my father. Pictures were frozen things. They told me nothing. But I knew that when my hair was wet I looked something like him. A quick flash would come back out of a mirror like a secret message, and I would think, there, that is how he was. I sat with Martin at the table, where my mother had spread a lace cloth, the vanished tenants, and over which the April sun through lace curtains laid still another design. I placed my hands flat under lace shadows, and wondered if they were like my father's, too. She had put out everything she could find to eat and drink, a few sweet biscuits, cheese cut almost as thin as paper, dark bread, small whole tomatoes, radishes, slices of salami arranged in a floral design on a dish to make them seem more. We had a bottle of fizzy wine that Martin called champagne. It had a brown tint, like watered iodine, and a taste of molasses. Through this murk bubbles climbed. 
We raised our glasses without saying what we drank to, other than my return. Perhaps Martin drank to his destiny in Franconia with the two apartments. I had a plan, but it was my own secret. By a common accord, there was no mutual past. Then my mother spoke from behind the cupped hand and said she would like us to drink to her missing elder son. She looked at Martin as she said this, in case the survival of Chris might be a burden too. Toward the end of that afternoon, a neighbor came in with a bottle of brandy, a stout man with three locks of slick gray hair across his skull. All the fat men of comic stories and of literature were to be Willie Valor to me in the future. But he could not have been all that plump in Berlin in 1950. His chin probably showed the beginnings of softness, and his hair must have been dark still. And there must have been plenty of it. I can see the start of his baldness. The two deep peninsulas of polished skin running from the corners of his forehead to just above his ears. Willie Whaler was another Franconian. He and Martin began speaking in dialect almost at once. Willie was at a remove, however. He mispronounced words as though to be funny, and he would grin and look at me. This was to say that he knew better, and he knew that I knew. Martin and Willie hated Berlin. They sounded as if they had been dragged to Berlin against their will, like displaced persons. In their eyes, the deepest failure of a certain political authority was that it had enticed peace-loving persons with false promises of work, homes, pensions, lives afloat like little boats at anchor. Now these innocent provincials saw they had been tricked, and they were going back where they had started from. It was as simple to them as that, the equivalent of an insurance company's no longer meeting its obligations. Willie even described the life he would lead now in a quiet town, where, in sight of a cobbled square with a fountain and an equestrian statue, he planned to open a perfume and cosmetic shop. People wanted beauty now. He would live above the shop. He was not too proud for that. And every morning he would look down on his blue store awnings, over window boxes stuffed with frilled petunias. My stepfather heard this with tears in his eyes. But perhaps he was thinking of his two apartments and of Elki and the Spitz. Willie's future seemed so real, so close at hand, that it was almost as though he had dropped in to say goodbye. He sat with his daughter on his knees, a baby not yet three. This little girl, whose name was Gisela, became a part of my life from that afternoon. And so did Fat Willie, though none of us knew it then. The secret to which I had drunk my silent toast was a girl in France, who would be a middle-aged woman beyond my imagining now if she had lived. She died by jumping or accidentally falling out of a fifth-floor window in Paris. Her parents had locked her in a room when they found out she was corresponding with me. This was still an afternoon in April in Berlin, the first of my freedom. It was one day after old Adolf's birthday, but that was not mentioned, not even in dialect or in the form of a Berlin joke. I don't think they were avoiding it. They had simply forgotten. They would always be astonished when other people turned out to have more specific memories of time and events. This was the afternoon about which I would always say to myself, I should have known. And even I knew, knew that I would marry the baby whose movements were already so willful and quick that her father complained, we can't take her anywhere, and sat holding both her small hands in his. Otherwise, she would have clutched at every glass within reach. 
Her winged brows reminded me of the girl I wanted to see again. Gisela's eyes were amber in color and luminous, with the whites so pure they seemed blue. The girl in France had eyes that resembled dark petals, opaque and velvety and slightly tilted. She had black hair from a Corsican grandmother and long, fine lashes. Gisela's lashes were stubby and thick. I found that I was staring at the child's small ears and her small, perfect teeth, thinking all the while of the other girl, whose smile had been spoiled by the malnutrition and the poor dentistry of the occupation. I should have realized then, as I looked at Willie and his daughter, that some people never go without milk and eggs and apples, whatever the landscape and that the sparse feast on our table had more to do with my mother's long habit of poverty, a kind of fatalistic incompetence that came from never having had enough money, than with a real shortage of food. Willie had on a white nylon shirt, which was a luxury then. Later, Martin would say to me, That Willie! out of a black uniform and into the black market before you could say democracy. But I never knew whether it was a common Berlin joke or something Martin had made up or the truth about Willie. Gisela, who was either slow to speak for her age or only lazy, looked at me and said, Man. All she had to declare. Her hair was so silky and fine that it reflected the day as a curve of mauve light. She was all light and sheen, and she was the first person, I can even say the first thing, I had ever seen that was unflawed, without shadow. She was as whole and as innocent as a drop of water, and she was without guilt. Her hands, released when her father drank from his wine glass, patted the tablecloth, seized a radish, tried to stuff it in his mouth. My mother sat with her chair pushed back a few respectful inches. Do you like children, Thomas? she said. She knew nothing about me now except that I was not a child. The French girl was sixteen when she came to Brittany on a holiday with her father and mother. The next winter she sent me books so that I would not drop too far behind in my schooling, and the second summer she came to my room. The door to the room was in a bend of the staircase, halfway between the pharmacy on the ground floor and the flat where my employers lived. They were supposed to keep me locked in this room when I wasn't working, but the second summer they forgot or could not be bothered, and in any case I had made a key with a piece of wire by then. It was the first room I'd had to myself. I whitewashed the walls and boxed in the store of potatoes they kept on the floor in a corner. Bunches of wild plants and herbs the druggist used in prescriptions hung from hooks in the ceiling. One whole wall was taken up with shelves of drying leaves and roots, walnut leaves for treating anemia, chamomile for fainting spells, thyme and rosemary for muscular cramps, and nettles and mint, sage and dandelions. The fragrance in the room and the view of the port from the window could have given me almost enough happiness for a lifetime, except that I was too young to find any happiness in that. How she escaped from her parents the first afternoon I never knew, but she was a brave, careless girl and had already escaped from them often. They must have known what could happen when they locked that wild spirit into a place where the only way out was a window. Perhaps they were trying to see how far they could go with a margin of safety. She left a message for them. To teach you a lesson. She must have thought she would be there and not there, lost to them and yet able to see the result. There was no message for me except that it is a terrible thing to be alone. But I had already learned it. 
She must have knelt on the windowsill. The autumn rain must have caught her lashes and hair. She was already alien on the windowsill, beyond recognition. I had made my room as neat for her as though I were expecting a military inspection. I wondered if she knew how serious it would be for both of us if we were caught. She glanced at the view, but only to see if anyone could look in on us. And she laughed, starting to take off her pullover, arms crossed. Then stopped and said, What is it? Are you made of ice? How could she know that I was retarded? I had known nothing except imagination and solitude, and the praying of old soldiers. And I was too old for one and repelled by the other. I thought she was about to commit the sacrifice of her person, her physical self, and her immortal soul. I had heard the old men talking about women as if women were dirt, but needed for that. One man said he would cut off an ear for that. Another said he would swim the Atlantic. I thought she would lie in some way convenient to me and that she would feel nothing but a kind of sorrow, which would have made it a pure gift. But there was nothing to ask. It was not a gift. It was her decision, and not a gift but an adventure. She hadn't come here to look at the harbor, she told me when I hesitated. I may even have said no. And it might have been then that she smiled at me over crossed arms, pulling off her sweater and said, Are you made of ice? For all her jauntiness, she thought she was deciding her life, though she continued to use the word adventure. I think it was the only other word she knew for love. But all we were settling was her death, and my life was decided in Berlin when Willie Vailer came in with a bottle of brandy and Gisella who refused to say more than man. I can still see the lace curtains, the mark on the wallpaper, the china ornaments left by the people who had gone in such a hurry, the chimney sweep with his matchstick broom, the girl with bobbed orange hair sitting on a crescent moon, the dog with the ruff around his neck. And when I remember this, I say to myself, I must have known. We finished two bottles of Martin's champagne, and then my mother jumped to her feet to remove the glasses and bring others so that we could taste Willie Whaler's brandy. The dirty Belgian is still hanging around, he said to Martin, gently rocking the child who now had her thumb in her mouth. What does he want? said my stepfather. He repeated the question. He was slow, and he thought that other people, unless they reacted at once and with a show of feeling, could not hear him. He was in the Waffen SS, he says. He complains that the girls here won't go out with him, though only five or six years ago they were like flies. They are afraid of him, came my mother's timid voice. He stands in the court and stares. I don't like men who look at pure young girls, said Willie Whaler. He said to me, help me, you owe me help. He says he fought for us and nobody thanked him. He did? No wonder we lost, said Martin. I had already seen that the survivors of the war were divided into those who said they had always known how it would all turn out, and those who said they had been indifferent. There are also those who like wars and those who do not. Martin had never been committed to winning or to losing or to anything. That explained his jokes. He had gained two apartments and one requisitioned flat in Berlin. He had lost a wife, but he often said to me later that people were better off out of this world. In Belgium he was in jail, said Willie. He says he fought for us, and then he was in jail, and now we won't help him, and the girls won't speak to him. 
Why is he here? My stepfather suddenly shouted. Who let him in? All this is his own affair, not ours. He rocked in his chair in a peculiar way, perhaps only imitating the gentle motion Willie made to keep Gisela asleep and quiet. Nobody owes him anything, cried my stepfather, striking the table so that the little girl started and shuddered. My mother touched his arm and made a sort of humming sound, with her lips pressed together that I took to be a signal between them, for he at once switched to another topic. It was a theme of conversation I was to hear about for many years after that afternoon. It was what the old men had to say when they were not boasting about women or their own past, and it was this. What should the Scherner army have done in Czechoslovakia to avoid capture by the Russians? And why did General Eisenhower, the villain of the story, refuse to help? Eisenhower was my stepfather's left hand, General Scherner was his right, and the Russians were a plate of radishes. I turned very slightly to look at my mother. She had that sad cast of feature women have when their eyes are fixed nowhere. Her hand still lay lightly on Martin Tupler's sleeve. I supposed then that he really was her husband, and that they slept in the same bed. I had seen one or two closed doors in the passage on my way to the bath. Of my first prison camp, where everyone had been under eighteen or over forty, I remembered the smell of the old men, how they stopped being clean when there were no women to make them wash, and I remembered their long boasting. And yet, that April afternoon, as the sunlight of my first hours of freedom moved over the table and up along the brown wall, I did my boasting too. I told about a prisoner I had captured. It seemed to be the thing I had to say to two men I had never seen before. He landed in a field just outside my grandmother's village, I told them. I was fourteen. Three of us saw him. Three boys. We had French rifles captured in the 1870 war. He'd had time to fold his parachute and he was sitting on it. I knew only one thing in English. It was, hands up. My stepfather's mouth was open, as it had been when I first walked into the flat that day. My mother stood just out of sight. We advanced, pointing our 1,870 rifles, I went on, droning, just like the old prisoners of war. We all now said, hands up. The prisoner just... I made the gesture the American had made of chasing a fly away, and I realized I was drunk. He didn't stand up. He had put everything he had on the ground a revolver, a wad of German money, a handkerchief with a map of Germany, and some smaller things we couldn't identify at once. He had on civilian shoes with thick soles. He very slowly undid his watch and handed it over. But we had no ruling about that, so we said no. He put the watch on the ground next to the revolver and the map. Then he slowly got up and strolled into the village with his hands in his pockets. He was chewing gum. I saw he had kept his cigarettes, but I didn't know the rule about that either. We kept our guns trained on him. The schoolmaster ran out of my grandmother's guest house. Everyone ran to stare. He was excited and kept saying in English, How do you do? How do you do? But then an officer came running, too, and he was screaming, Why are you interfering? You may ask only one thing. Is he English or American? The teacher was glad to show off his English, and he asked, Are you English or American? And the American seemed to move his tongue all round his mouth before he answered. 
He was the first foreigner any of us had ever seen, and they took him away from us. We never saw him again. That seemed all there was to it, but Martin's mouth was still open. I tried to remember more. There was hell because we had left the gun and the other things on the ground. By the time they got out to the field, someone had stolen the parachute, probably for the cloth. We were in trouble over that, and we never got credit for having taken a prisoner. I went back to the field alone later on. I wanted to cry for some reason, because it was over. He was from an adventure story to me. The whole war was a Carl May adventure, when I was fourteen and running around in school holidays with a gun. I found some small things in the field that had been overlooked. Pills for keeping awake. Pills in transparent envelopes. I had never seen that before. One envelope was called motion sickness. It was a crime to keep anything, but I kept it anyway. I still had it when the Americans captured me, and they took it away. I had kept it because it was from another world. I would look at it and wonder. I kept it because of the last of the Mohicans, because... because... This was the longest story I had ever told in my life. I added, My grandmother is dead now. My stepfather had finally shut his mouth. He looked at my mother as if to say that she had brought him a rival in the only domain that mattered, the right to talk everyone's ear off. My mother edged close to Willie Vailer and urged him to eat bread and cheese. She was still in the habit of wondering what the other person thought, and how important he might be and how safe it was to speak. But Willie had not heard more than a sentence or two. That was plain from the way the expression on his face came slowly awake. He opened his eyes wide, as if to get sleep out of them, and, evidently imagining I had been talking about my life in France, said, What were you paid as a prisoner? I had often wondered what the first question would be once I was home. Now I had it. Ha! said my stepfather, giving the impression that he expected me to be caught out in a monstrous lie. One franc forty centums a month for working here and there on a farm, I said. But when I became a free worker with a druggist, the official pay was three thousand francs a month, and that was what he gave me. I paused. And of course I was fed and housed and had no laundry bills. Did you have bed sheets? said my mother. With the druggist's family always. I had one sheet folded in half. It was just right for a small cot. Was it the same sheet as the kind the family had? She said, in the hesitant way that was part of her person now. They didn't buy sheets especially for me, I said. I was treated fairly by the druggist, but not by the administration. Aha, uh -huh, said the two older men, almost together. The administration refused to pay my fare home, I said looking down into my glass the way I had seen the men in prison camp stare at a fixed point when they were recounting a grievance. A prisoner of war has the right to be repatriated at administration expense. The administration would not pay my fare because I had stayed too long in France. But that was their mistake. I bought a ticket as far as Paris on the pay I had saved. The druggist sold me some old shoes and trousers and a jacket of his. My own things were in rags. In Paris, I went to the YMCA. The YMCA was supposed to be in charge of prisoners' rights. The man wouldn't listen to me. If I had been left behind, then I was not a prisoner, he said. I was a tourist. It was his duty to help me. 
Instead of that, he informed the police. For the first time, my voice took on the coloration of resentment. I knew that this complaint about a niggling matter of train fare made my whole adventure seem small. But I had become an old soldier. I remembered the police commissioner, with his thin lips and dirty nails, who said, You should have been repatriated years ago when you were sixteen. It was a mistake, I told him. Your papers are full of strange mistakes, he said, bending over them. There. One capital error. An omission. A grave omission. What is your mother's maiden name? Wickler, I said. I watched him writing W-I-E-K-L-A-R, slowly, with the tip of his tongue sticking out of the corner of his mouth as he wrote. You have been here for something like five years with an incomplete dossier. And what about this? Who crossed it out? I did. My father was not a pastry cook. You could be fined or even jailed for this, he said. My father was not a pastry cook, I said. He had tuberculosis. He was not allowed to handle food. Willie Whaler did not say what he thought of my story, perhaps not having any opinion about injustice, even the least important, had become a habit of his, like my mother's of speaking through her fingers. He was on the right step of that staircase I've spoken of. Even the name he had given his daughter was a sign of his sensitivity to the times. Nobody wanted to hear the pagan, old Germanic names anymore. Sigrun and Brunhilde and Sieglinda. Willie had felt the change. He would have called any daughter something neutral and pretty, Gisela, Marianne, Elizabeth, any time after the Battle of Stalingrad. All Willie ever had to do was sniff the air. He pushed back his chair. In later years, he would be able to push a table away with his stomach and got to his feet. He had to tip his head to look up into my eyes. He said he wanted to give me advice that would be useful to me as a late homecomer. His advice was to forget. Forget everything, he said. Forget, forget. That was what I said to my good neighbor Herr Silber when I bought his wife's topaz brooch and earrings before he emigrated to Palestine. I said, Dear Herr Silber, Look forward, never back, and forget, forget, forget. The child in Willie's arms was in the deepest of sleeps. Martin Tupler followed his friend to the door. They whispered together. Then the door closed behind both men. They have gone to have a glass of something at Herr Vailer's, said my mother. I saw now that she was crying quietly. She dried her eyes on her apron and began clearing the table of the homecoming feast. Willie Whaler has been kind to us, she said. Don't repeat that thing. About forgetting? No, about the topaz brooch. It was a crime to buy anything from Jews. It doesn't matter now. She lowered the tray she held and looked pensively out at the wrecked houses across the street. If only people knew beforehand what was allowed, she said. My father is probably a hero now, I said. Oh, Thomas, don't travel too fast. We haven't seen the last of the changes, yes, a hero. But too late for me, I've suffered too much. What does Martin think that he died of? A working accident. He can understand that. You could have said consumption. He did have it. She shook her head. Probably she had not wanted Martin to imagine he could ever be saddled with two sickly stepsons. Where do you and Martin sleep? In the room next to the bathroom. Didn't you see it? 
You'll be comfortable here in the parlor. The couch pulls out. You can stay as long as you like. This is your home. A home for you and Chris. She said this so stubbornly that I knew some argument must have taken place between her and Martin. I intended this room to be my home. There was no question about it in my mind. I had not yet finished high school. I had been taken out for anti-aircraft duty, then sent to the front. The role of adolescents in uniform had been to try to prevent the civilian population from surrendering. We were expected to die in the ruins together. When the women ran pillowcases up flagpoles, we shinnied up to drag them down. We were prepared to hold the line with our 1870 rifles until we saw the American tanks. There had not been tanks in our Carl May adventure stories, and the Americans, finally, were not out of the last of the Mohicans. I told my mother that I had to go back to high school and then I would apply for a scholarship and take a degree in French. I would become a schoolmaster. French was all I had for my captivity. I might as well use it. I would earn money doing translations. That cheered her up. She would not have to ask the ex-tram conductor too many favors. Translations and scholarship were an exalted form of language to her. As a schoolmaster, I would have the most respectable job in the family, now that Uncle Gerhard was raising rabbits. As long as it doesn't cost him too much, she said, as if she had to say it, and yet was hoping I wouldn't hear. It was not strictly true that all I had got out of my captivity was the ability to speak French. I had also learned to cook, iron, make beds, wait on table, wash floors, polish furniture, plant a vegetable garden, paint shutters. I wanted to help my mother in the kitchen now, but that shocked her. Rest, she said but I did not know what rest meant. I've never seen a man drying a glass, she said in apology. I wanted to tell her that while the roads and bridges of France were still waiting for someone to rebuild them, I had been taught how to make a tomato salad by the druggist's wife, but I could not guess what the word France conveyed to her imagination. I began walking about the apartment. I looked in on a store cupboard, a water closet smelling of carbolic, the bathroom again, then a room containing a high bed, a brown wardrobe, and a table covered with newspapers bearing half a dozen of the flowerless, spiky, dull green plants my mother had always tended with so much devotion. I shut the door as if on a dark past and I said to myself, I am free. This is the beginning of life. It is also the start of the good half of a rotten century. Everything ugly and corrupt and vicious is behind us. My thoughts were not exactly in those words, but something like them. I said to myself, This apartment has a musty smell an old and dirty smell that sinks into clothes. After a time, I shall probably smell like the dark parlor. The smell must be in the cushions, in the bed that pulls out, in the lace curtains. It is a smell that creeps into night clothes. The blankets will be permeated. I thought, I shall get used to the smell, and the smell of burning in the stone outside. The view of ruins will be my view. Every day on my way home from school I shall walk over Elka. I shall get used to the wood staircase, the bell pull, the polished nameplate, the white enamel fuses in the hall. My mother had said, When you want light in the parlor you give the center fuse in the lower row a half turn. I looked at a framed drawing of cartoon people with puffy hair. 
a strong wind had blown their umbrella inside out. They would be part of my view, like the ruins. I took in the ancient gas bracket in the kitchen and the stone sink. My mother, washing glasses without soap, smiled at me, forgetting to hide her teeth. I re-examined the tiled stove in the parlor, the wood and the black briquettes that would be next to my head at night, and the glass-fronted cabinet full of the china ornaments God had selected to survive the Berlin air raids. These would be removed to make way for my books. For Martin Tupler need not imagine he could count on my pride, or that I would prefer to starve rather than take his charity, or that I was too arrogant to sleep on his dusty sofa. I would wear out his soap, borrow his shirts, spread his butter on my bread. I would hang on Martin like an octopus. He had a dependent now, a ravenous, egocentric, late homecoming high school adolescent of 21. The old men owed this much to me, the old men in my prison camp who would have sold mother and father for an extra ounce of soup, who had already sold their children for it, the old men who had fouled my idea of women, the old men in the bunkers who had let the girls defend them in Berlin, the old men who had dared to survive. The bed that pulled out was sure to be all lumps. I had slept on worse. Would it be wide enough for Chris, too? People in the habit of asking themselves silent, useless questions look for answers in mirrors. My hair was blonde again now that it had dried. I looked less like my idea of my father. I tried to see the reflection of the man who had gone out in the middle of the night and who never came back. You don't go out alone to tear down election posters in a village where nobody thinks as you do. Not unless you want to be stabbed in the back. So the family had said. You were well out of it, I said to the shadow that floated on the glass panel of the china cabinet, though it would not be my father's again unless I could catch it unaware. I said to myself, It is quieter than France. They keep their radios low. In captivity, I had never suffered a pain except for the cramps of hunger the first years which had been replaced by a scratching, morbid anxiety, and the pain of homesickness, which takes you in the stomach and the throat. Now I felt the first of the real pains that were to follow me like little dogs for the rest of my life, perhaps. The first compressed my knee, the second tangled the nerves at the back of my neck, I discovered that my eyes were sensitive and that it hurt to blink. This was the hour when, in Brittany, I would begin peeling the potatoes for dinner. I had seen food my mother had never heard of, oysters and artichokes. My mother had never seen a harbor or a sea. My American prisoner had left his immediate life spread on an alien meadow his parachute, his revolver, his German money. He had strolled into captivity with his hands in his pockets. I know what you are thinking, said my mother, who was standing behind me. I know that you are judging me. If you could guess what my life has been, the whole story, not only the last few years, you wouldn't be hard on me. I turned too slowly to meet her eyes. It was not what I had been thinking. I had forgotten about her in that sense. No, no, nothing like that, I said. I still did not touch her. What I had been moving along to in my mind was, Why am I in this place? Who sent me here? Is it a form of justice or injustice? How long does it last? Now we can wait together for Chris, she said. She seemed young and happy all at once. Look, Thomas, a new moon. 
bow to it three times. Wait, you must have something silver in your hand. I saw that she was hurrying to finish with this piece of nonsense before Martin came back. She rummaged in the china cabinet and brought out a silver napkin ring, left behind by the vanished tenants, probably. The name on it was Meta. No one we knew. Bow to the moon and hold it and make your wish, she said. Quickly. You first. She wished, I am sure, for my brother. As for me, I wished that I was a few hours younger in the corridor of a packed train, clutching the top of the open window, my heart hammering as I strained to find the one beloved face.